if you want to have a long, happy life, you know what you need to do. You need to be in shape. You need to be fit. You need to, you know, do the things that make you fit and have fitness, right? Well, what if that is not true? Crazy as that sounds. We're going to look into that in today's episode of The Movement. Movement, the podcast for people who want to know the truth about what it takes to have a happy, healthy, strong body, starting typically feet first, because you know those things are your foundation. And here we break down the propaganda, the mythology, sometimes the outright lies you've been told about what it takes to run or walk or play or hike, or in this case, just live for the remainder of your life. And to do that enjoyably and efficiently and effectively and did I say enjoyably? Don't answer. It's a trick question because I know I did. Because look, if you're not having fun, do something different till you are. Because if it's not fun, you're not going to keep it up anyway. So why add more stress? Um, we call this the movement movement because we're creating a movement. And that we part is something that you and I are involved in. Doesn't take any effort, really. I'll tell you more in a second. The other part, the movement movement, is that we're creating this movement around natural movement, letting your body do what it's made to do instead of getting in the way and making life more difficult. I'm Stephen Sashin from ZeroShoes.com, your host of this thing. And all you need to do is really simple. Um, you know, like if you want to go to our website, www.jointhemovementmovement.com, you don't need to do anything to join. There's no membership fee. There's no membership, really. Just like and share, find the previous episodes, subscribe, hit the thumbs up. Up, uh, or the bell icon or wherever, you know, basically, look, you know, the drill. If you want to be part of the tribe, please subscribe. Or if you think there's other people who should be part of the tribe, please subscribe there too. So um, like I said in the intro, maybe fitness is not the goal that you should be looking for. And Kyle, please do me a favor. Tell human beings who you are and what you do and what you said that made me say that. My name is Kyle Fincham. I am currently traveling across the globe, teaching a workshop that I call Infinite Play. Uh, which is basically just exploring the mindset of playfulness through the vehicle of movement. Um, I'm currently in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm flying out to Europe next week. Where in Brooklyn are you? I am in Bushwick right now. I was in Brooklyn a little while ago, and I, at every moment, was afraid I was going to get a ticket for not having a man bun or some <laughs> other, you know, some other hip thing that I do not do. Yeah, I used to. Maybe about ten years ago, I was totally hip enough for any of the neighborhoods that I fell into. But now I walk out the door and I'm like, I have, I've passed that time. The, actually, one of the last times I was in Brooklyn, I was stunned to go by a guy who was selling artisanal pickles, $5 each for a pickle, wow. five bucks, pickle. Wow. Yeah. You yeah. know what? I got back into eating bread when I was back in Europe uh, last you. year and the baguettes are like, you know, a buck 50 or two bucks or right. something here. And here a baguette is like four or five bucks and it's just from a grocery store or something. Oh, no. I mean, well, everything in and around New York has gotten expensive. I, Lane and I were there two weeks ago, I think, um, for a board meeting. And I met a couple of friends for breakfast and uh, three eggs and toast. Guess how much? 12 bucks. Oh, you're so cute. 18 to 20. Three oh. eggs and toast. When you I think that it hit me in the chest. Yeah, I got a, I got a down payment on a piece of pizza. Wow. So it is. I mean, pizza used to be a buck, buck and a half. And now, you know, three seventy five. dollars Anyway, enough about um, the price of food in and around the great city of New York. Um, so, Infinite Place, say more about that and how that relates to what I kind of tease this with about fitness and maybe it's not the best thing for uh, best goal to have or the thing that you need. Yeah, I think that, you know, we're kind of led to believe that like if we're strong, if we're flexible, if we're mobile, if we have a, a whole bunch of moves and techniques that it's synonymous with being able to move through life playfully. And I've just come to believe that that's not the case, that in some ways kind of getting caught up in the systems or the boxes or the definitions can actually be this great limitation for us because life is full of surprises. Life is random. Life is accidents. And to move through it playfully means to be welcoming of surprise and welcoming of the randomness and welcoming of the accidents. And maybe sometimes that means we're strong in certain areas, we're kind of flexible in certain areas, or we have some moves, but having kind of the, the full collection of all is not the same as being able to move through life the way the rest of the animals, and the rest of nature navigates life. And that's what I like to explore in my workshop. 
Fascinating. So then we're using the word move in maybe two different ways. One about the movements involved in fitness activities, for example, um, being able to run, being able to lift, being able to climb, being able to whatever. But another, uh, when you're talking about moving through life, there's more of a metaphorical component to that. So can you kind of pick that apart a little for me? So I, and, and maybe you can do that by explaining something more about what somebody would do if they were joining you for a workshop. Totally. Well, I mean, ultimately at the end of the day, movement is not just an activity that we do. Movement is our way of communicating with the world. We just have this privilege of having to not use our um, our full library of communication skills because everything is kind of convenient and sanitized at this point. But movement, you know, worked in relation with our senses and we would use that to kind of move through life in terms of how we communicate with other people, how we communicate with the spaces that we move through. And that's why we have this kind of uh, amazing potential for movement. So in my workshop, I'm not so much caught up in like kind of distilling down all the different movements and break them into what we can do. I'm kind of interested in presenting scenarios where we're willing to get lost, Mm -hmm. right? And be okay with that rather than having to Google map everything. Interesting. So I'm going to ask you this question, but I have to tell you a story before you answer it. The question is, given that, and given that this is the movement movement podcast, um, I'm going to ask you to share something that people, so people can have an experience of what you're saying rather than just hearing it. And maybe kind of, you know, I'm doing this thing lately where I kind of go, Hmm. And I cock my head a little, like 45 degrees because um, my wife and I, for the first time in our lives are now dog owners. So we have a dog that is, you know, does that like what, but here's the story I'm going to tell you that maybe there's, I mean, it sounds like there may be an analog and I want you to tell me if it's true. When I was in my twenties, at the advice of a crazy girlfriend, I found myself in a group therapy group, not suggesting the group therapy means you're, I mean, it's a fine thing, but I I went because she told me to, and um, ultimately did not get a whole lot out of it. But there was this one great moment where I realized that everybody was sitting in the same seat, or more accurately, there's one person in particular who always sat in the same seat. And I happened to show up at the group one time earlier than anybody else. So I sat in quote, her seat. And she came in and told me to move. And I said, why? She says, that's my seat. I said, it's a seat. And uh, she got, went crazy. And when all the group was there, you know, there's a big kerfuffle about who was sitting where. And I remember at one point she said, I thought this was a safe space. I, and I said, it's safe enough to discover that you can sit anywhere and be okay. Mm-hmm. So am I way off base with that story? No, I mean, a story that I like to tell is a, one that a friend of mine shared with me about his time in college. And he and I are about the same age, like late 30s. So it was before there were Google Maps, which I referred to before. And he talked about how he and his friends would take road trips often during like the spring breaks and summer vacations and things like that. And he says that when he looks back on that time and those uh, adventures they went on, the things that he remembers most and the things that are most special to him are the times that they got lost. (laughs) And we have done this really great job of like making everything fast and efficient. Mm. Right. But at the same time, we've limited getting lost Mm. and the magic I think might be in the getting lost. I, you know, there's a variation of that. I remember having to drive when I was living in New York City, this is 30 years ago, I had to drive to somewhere outside of Scranton, Pennsylvania. There's a camp that I went to as a kid. They were having a 50th anniversary party and I had to go. And I remember looking at a map, uh, if people remember what those are, an actual map, like in a in a big, big atlas kind of book thing. And I, what was really fun is the maps had roadside attractions that were clearly marked. And in the middle of Pennsylvania, you know, there was a a wild animal preserve or like a reptile and some other strange animal sanctuary or something. And it was like all these wacky things. And I built a trip around everything that was off the main roads to just go from one of these things to another, to another, to another. And uh, it was totally ridiculous and delightful. And you just can't do that anymore. I mean, not by looking at a you know, like not looking at Google Maps. Right. And I think that the, the the larger repercussions of this this way is that it makes us think that like we can kind of control and be certain of everything and we can limit our loss and we can prevent surprise. Mm. So that ultimately when those things do happen, we're, we kind of panic. We're not really prepared to like be with surprise. We're not really prepared to be with lost mm. when it's totally inevitable. 
You know, like it's going to happen. We're and going so, to trip. And so you're suggesting, and I'm going to get back to the give something to people to share or share something with people. You're suggesting, it sounds, that the things that we are currently doing for fitness are antithetical to that idea of just being open to what's happening and able to respond accordingly, whether it's sort of, let's call it a mental or physical movement. Yeah, I think that the things that we're doing now are, are fine if we also do the other thing. Okay. You know, like we, there's a lot of like, um, there's a lot of precision and not a lot of romance. And I think that we, <laughs> um, you know, there's a great book called, I think it's just called muscle about a guy who moved to New York when he was in his like graduated college or maybe grad school and got a job in publishing and felt really insecure in New York and felt kind of, uh, at the whim and mercy of New York. And so he got into bodybuilding and it's a really interesting book about that goes, back and forth, chapter by chapter, between what it was like to train to become a bodybuilder and what was going on in his mind about this and how he was able to or not able to roll with the punches, as it were. And it's a, it was a fascinating, fascinating book because it's really describing exactly what you're talking about. But you know, well, I mean, like, you know, I was part of the CrossFit world in, in a certain degree for a short period of time. And like the irony is we sit around telling people like we want them to be able to think outside the box. But the gym is actually called a box. <laughs> my my first time that I was in a CrossFit box um, and someone had me go through one of the workouts, um, you know, they're yelling at me like, go, go, go. And, and I literally turned at one point and said, I, your yelling does not give me any motivation. I mean, I, I'm, I'm self-motivated. I'm curious to see how I can do the next time. But there's no prize money at the end of this. This is not a real competition. I just don't care that much. If it's fun, I'll do it. If it's not fun, I'm not going to do it. Well, and also, you know, competition is just so of this part of the world at this day and age. And, you know, I think we kind of celebrate it and make everything into like the, the, we think that it's the way, but I think that we've made it really far by, by also being quite cooperative. And I think mm. that things like play are our places to kind of explore our potential for cooperation. Mm. And it's a powerful tool, but I think that in our, in our world and the way we kind of exist now, it's maybe it's a bit of like a, a privilege to get to kind of exist in a, a very competitive settings all the time, but I'm, I'm not so sold on it. Well, I can tell you from my experience, there's two things. One, as a competitive sprinter, I love the competition because it, for a couple of reasons, one, I have a naturally competitive streak in me. So it gives me a place to indulge in that um, in a way that's entertaining. Um, it also gives me a reason to get out on the track because I'm imagining these things that I want to accomplish because I enjoy doing them. Um, mm -hmm. And so it gives me a bit of a focus when I was doing physical things where there was no end result. Um, some of the things I was doing, it's like, oh, this is more pain than gain. So I'm mm -hmm. not going to, I'm not going to do it. But I like that. The flip side is I, I will say that the more I've come to understand what big shoe companies have been doing for 50 years and how it's been hurting people and how we're hearing from people daily saying, oh my God, this natural movement thing changed my life. It's brought out a competitive streak in me in, on the business side that I didn't really know that I had. And mm -hmm. I, it's engaging in a certain way, but I can't say it's enjoyable. Mm -hmm. um, and the cooperation thing is intriguing because I'm like, I'm friends with most of my competitors because we are all trying to do the same thing. We need to play together in some way. So it's a really interesting kind of balance between uh, it's like when I'm at the track, some guy will usually say, you know, like really intense, like, you know, good, good luck in the race. Good. Have a good race. And I'll say, Hey, hey dude, there's no prize money. There's no sponsorship. Have fun. Hopefully you won't get injured. Oh, and by the way, I totally want to kick your ass. <laughs> and, and I say it that kind of casually because it really is that casual. I will or I won't. Who cares? It doesn't really matter in the long run. I, rumor has it my wife won't leave me if I'm second in 100 meters. Um, I don't know. Uh, so, all right. I've, I've mentioned this five times or so. So now I'm going to put you on the spot. So it gives people something that they can experience from what we've been talking about, which is, again, a, can be a little... Out in the I'll, I'll give two things. And one of them I kind of already mentioned, but I'll give two. Okay. The first one is very much a movement task. Okay. Um, and it's one that I use often, but grab a ball, any kind, like a tennis ball or uh, a lacrosse ball, whatever you got, lay it on the ground, get onto the floor on your hands and your feet or your hands and your knees. I don't really care. And maybe move just in that position around on the floor and just keep the ball moving. 
keep the ball moving only using your hands and your feet. And then if your hands and your feet have seemed to, you've like felt like you've become competent, maybe use other parts of your body to keep the ball moving, like your shoulder or your elbow or your wrist or your chin, back of your head, right? And just keep the ball moving. Ooh, that's a really good question if someone, as someone's doing that, to wonder every now and then what part of my body haven't I used? It's also a good opportunity to drag in your friend or your roommate or your spouse and ask them to t- tell you what part of your body to touch the ball with. Oh, that's a good one too. I, um, this reminds me, I, I've been known to do things at workshops where they say, you know, find a safe space to do something. Uh, I've been known to walk out the door because <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking, what's the most, what's the most outrageous way I could do this thing that they're asking? What would be the one thing that no one thought to do? And then mm-hmm. like, you know, leave. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love that. I love that. It's a nice risk. I it's like a good, that. Well, you know, I mean, I'm I'm kind of curious to see what'll happen. Um, mm-hmm. That's a good one. So, and was the first one just go somewhere and get lost? Yeah, yeah. or I mean, like walk out your front door yeah. and get on your bike or drive in your car, or ideally take a walk in zero shoes uh, <laughs> or barefoot. But don't turn on Google Maps mm. and start heading in a direction you know. And then when you get to an intersection when you normally would have turned right turn left and just see what happens, you know, go get lost because both of these things are being playful. Both of these things are kind of the willingness to be surprised and kind of bask in the surprise Mm. and, you know, getting places efficiently and and always trying to treat things as if they're like a game to win is when we start limiting surprise, right? Because as you know, as a competitor, when you're in competition mode, like you want as few surprises as possible. Right. Right. You don't want to trip on a stone. You don't want to like feel something that's like you want to every as much as you can control, you want to control for like that moment in time. But when we start doing life that way, when we start trying to limit surprise and try to uh, only do things that we're competent at, right? When the things happen that we're not competent at, or when surprise unfolds, or when the randomness happens we're just not prepared. Right. And we, we get rigid in the way that we, we, we respond to surprise when we're not welcoming of surprise is to try to like defeat, destroy, control, submit, whatever that thing is. Yeah. As opposed to dance with it. Well, you know, it's funny about the, the, the structured competition at surprise. My favorite part of the race is the moment between mm-hmm. set and the gun going off because mm-hmm. the whole technique is to be ready for, to be surprised. It's like, you can't be ready to go. You have to be, you kind of get set and, re- and you're ready to go. And then you just have to be surprised. And I, it's actually my favorite thing when someone literally does surprise me, they come up behind me and I don't hear them because it's the most unadulterated. And I never thought of it this way, unadulterated experience of just like jumping in the air and being shocked. I, I just totally, totally enjoy it. Yeah. So I use this quote often. So the reason I call my workshop Infinite Play is because I read this book, Finite and Infinite Games by James Cars. Mm -hmm. And there's a famous quote that he has in there. And it's something like, um, to be prepared against surprise is to be trained. To be prepared for surprise is to be educated. (laughs) I like it. So when when you're doing the workshops, what kind of people show up? What are they expecting and what surprises them when they go through it? I think uh, it, when I first started teaching, there was a lot of people who came from like movement, like kind of like the big M movement that seems to exist in the world now, because that's where I was like, found. like, like movement, culture movement. I've been studying with Ido Portal for a really long time. So a lot of people who have movement facilities Got have it. hosted me and had me and they're amazing. And then a lot of more recently, I think it's starting to transcend a little bit. Like the, the the gaps are getting a little wider. The demographic is changing. It's a lot of different people. It's not necessarily people who come from movement, but who are maybe interested in movement philosophically. Mm. But in the end, I think people are quite moved. And I don't mean physically <laughs> moved, but some people, I mean, there have been a couple of people who have been moved to tears. There are people who are kind of taken by the experience because ultimately we're like, we're really practicing communicating. We're practicing being with people right? We're practicing like that potential we have for like deep listening, but that means to deep listen with a group of people is also to feel listened to. Mm. And I think sometimes like people are taken by like what it feels like to be listened to because, and maybe in this world, there's not a lot of being listened to happening. <laughs> um, so I think that, yeah, there it's, it, it can be enriching and maybe so far as to healing for some people, but yeah, it's a, it's it's a special experience, and I think it, it's it, it's far from what anybody imagines. So often, when people ask, 
what should I expect? I'll be like, well, whatever you imagine, it's not that. And then when you imagine it again, it's not that either. Well, you, you, speaking of things you've mentioned, you've mentioned movement as communication a couple of times. Can you, can you dive into that a little bit? Cause I'm not quite clear how that works or what that, what you mean when you say that. Right. So before we could speak with words, right. We had sounds and we moved our body to try to like communicate. So even just in like a human to human interaction, we were moving our bodies to help kind of like navigate communication, but also human to human without even trying to communicate, our nervous systems are having a dialogue, Mm. right? So that's what like co-regulating is, right? Like I'm, I'm noticing your posture, your breath, your eyes, and I'm not thinking about it. It's not cognitive. Like this is something that's happening just in my own nervous system. And these are all different movements and things that are happening in our body. Right. But then on a, you know, more kind of, yeah. Thinking about like how we move through the world, like on an individual level, I need a body that's deeply communicative, right? Mm. I want joints that communicate with one another from the ground up, right? So that they move like a symphony, Mm. right? So that they're creative, adaptable, and cooperative with one another instead of kind of like rigid and isolated. Um, Same thing goes with people. I want to be able to be creative, adaptable, and cooperative, which means to communicate with another person so that when we walk into a scenario and you and I have like never done anything before, whether it's dancing together, fighting together, playing together, or talking with one another, I have the tools to kind of like move with that. And the same thing goes for the spaces that we move through, right? I I need those same qualities to walk into new and novel spaces and scenarios and situations so that I can have my dance or my play or my dialogue with whatever that is offering me. The image that I got when you were saying that is of someone or most of us not thinking of, well, it's going to sound weird. Um, I'm hacking it out in real time. Not thinking about how our very subtle movements, just the way we stand, the way we Mm -hmm. sit down, the way we stand back up, the way we take that first step. People don't think about that as a form of communication typically. Although the flip side in my thinking is I'm flashing back to when I was like in second or third grade. And I remember, or at least I have a memory, seemingly a memory of walking down the hall of my elementary school, practicing different ways of walking because I wanted to look like, you know, something I saw in a comic book or whatever it was, but we, we're not, we're not typically thinking about, you know, we get these patterns, we get locked in and we don't think about how they may be impacting the way people see us because what we're telling them without knowing what we're saying. Mm -hmm. And in, in, and in relation to walking, you know, multiple kind of dialogues are happening, right? We're having a conversation with the surface of the earth or the ground, mm. right? We're, we're dancing on it, right? But if we dance with it, we're always going to be more efficient, right? Um, again, like our joints are having this interaction as people are kind of moving around us. We're having these like nonverbal communicative interactions as we kind of navigate around like the spaces with the people, And that involves everything that involves like things that we can think about and so much that we can't think about, you know, that's why it's like, I say, like the way we actually move our body and like our full kind of sensory experience and everything that's happening, in our nervous system is an all at once in this kind of emergence that's Mm. happening. Have you, um, have you experienced that people in different cultures have a different relationship to this? And what I'm thinking Mm -hmm. of when I say that is like when I was just in New York or when I'm walking down the street and people are walking towards me and there's only so much room, I'm always interested to see how people respond to that. Like Mm -hmm. they're looking right at me and they don't get out of the way. For example, Mm -hmm. I find that utterly fascinating versus I remember when Lane and I were in India for a friend's wedding 15 years ago or so, tons and tons of people, less difficult interactions during the course of a day walking through tons of people in India than you have in five minutes in Whole Foods where people park their cart in the middle of an aisle and just, you know, randomly go off into space. Um, And it's like a whole different way of thinking about the way our bodies interact with that space and those people in that place. And I was wondering if you've seen similar things. Yeah. I mean, I haven't spent much time in like more collectivist cultures, but I mean, I read about them quite a bit. And I think in some ways what you're describing is kind of like people who have kind of emerged out of a culture that's a little bit more 
individualist, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the me, myself, and I attitude. So it's like, I'm not getting out of the way, or I'm going to win this walk this way, or, you know, (laughs) who cares what everybody else is doing? I'm parking my cart right here. Whereas in some of these other parts of the world, it's, it's, there's a little bit more we, us, and them. And not to say that that's like a, a, a better way to live either. I'm not proposing better or worse. Um, what I'm thinking more is that there's kind of, again, this like dance that can exist between the individual's mindset and like the collectivist mindset. So that like, you know, we see a little bit more of like we in me. Right. Um, and I think that um, there's something there. But yeah, I mean, speaking to what you're talking about, I think that it's it's really like a cultural emergence or a societal emergence in, in these very individualist places. And it's not a single person being like, I'm going to be this way. It's just kind of what's come out of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, you came out of the fitness world and I think came out of is an interesting phrase, both from an evolution and an escaping from perspective. Yeah. How did, I mean, what was the thing that kind of triggered that and how did you then develop what you're doing with infinite play? I mean, I was really practicing a lot. I was practicing like six hours a day this movement practice where things were in containers and things were really tight and rigid. And I progressed and could do amazing gymnastics things. And I could um, do amazing strength things. And I had these moves and some techniques and things, but I realized that like, I couldn't just show up and and play in any scenario, you know, like I, I needed kind of everything to be in place. Right. And then there was this really funny moment where I realized, Oh man, I can stand really well on my hands. I can almost do a one arm handstand but I subjectively, I move poorly on my feet. You know, that was kind of the catalyst for like, what's going on here, you know? Then, you know, I started thinking more philosophically about the things that I believe in and the things that I care about and the things that I value, you know, and playfulness became this word that just really like kind of captured a lot of the things that I care about. And I was talking to my friend, Marlo Fiskin, who's a really, really well-known pole movement teacher, performer, artist. She's a genius. And I just asked her one day, I said, you know, what do you feel like isn't talked about enough in movement? And she said, how our practice and our teaching can reflect the changes that we want to see in the world. And it was just kind of this aha moment where I thought to myself, wow, like I really care about what the world might look like if people were willing to welcome surprise rather than defeat surprise. Can I facilitate that? in what I present, you know, can movement be my vehicle for that? And uh, that was kind of the jumping off point. And so from there, I mean, it sounds like that was a kind of aha, but not clearly fully formed something. It had, you know, it, it, it at some point had to take on a bit more of a, I don't want to use the word structure incorrectly, but it had to, you know, become a bit more mm, tangible at the very least. And I like that idea. How, what happened as you were in terms of developing it? Yeah, well, I was uh, fortunate enough that when I was, I lived in Boulder for a few months and there was a group that would meet me out there in the park, in North Boulder Park twice a week. And they were just kind of like, I don't want to say guinea pigs because we were really working on things together and creating together, but I was facilitating and trying and experimenting. And every day I would just kind of walk in with a couple little like nuggets of ideas. But what I really thought to myself was, the teachers that I've been the most moved by in my entire life are not people who showed up with amazing content, even though the content ended up being amazing, but they showed up with a message. And then anything that they presented just went through the filter of that message. So every day I'd be like walking to the park and I would just be thinking to myself, okay, my message is playfulness. Playfulness means to welcome surprise and uncertainty. The tools for being welcoming surprise and uncertainty are to be creative, adaptable, and cooperative. And I would just kind of like say these things over and over and I'd walk in <laughs> with my little ideas and just kind of throw them out there. But then it also meant that I'd almost set it like a mantra to a point where I was like, I also need to welcome surprise. So whatever everybody else throws back at me, yeah, that's part of what we start cooking with together. So I might show up with an idea, but then part of play is letting it unfold. You mm-hmm. know, when it's too rigid and you're trying to hold it in place, well, that's not surprising anymore. So then, you know, I might propose, you know, this tennis ball game, for instance, but then they would start adding to it and creating their own scenarios. Like my friend who was a break dancer added his little pieces to it. And then, you know, this friend of mine who's a contemporary dancer added these other pieces to it. And I'm like, oh, well, that's what happens when you let everybody kind of add their spice to the soup rather than saying, I've got the recipe. No one else put anything else in. 
It's interesting because, you know, if you're trying to establish yourself as a teacher of a thing, you need a thing. And Mm -hmm. so this happened in the barefoot running movement back in 2009, 2010, where there was just maybe a dozen people who each were, you know, trying to carve out a thing. And it was Mm -hmm. very, it was definitely very rigid. It was like, you have to do it this way. It's like, no, no, you don't really have to. There's other ways of doing that. Yeah. Well, speaking we, before we spoke a little bit about like competition and cooperation, there's this book by this guy named Alfie Cohn called No Contest. And in there, he starts talking about the cooperative learning movement. And I think that maybe took hold in like the 80s or 90s, this huh. idea of cooperative learning, trying to push it in schools. But immediately when it kind of became popularized, people jumped in and were like, we need to create a system, a methodology, and people yeah. wanted to sell the system. And it inevitably didn't work. And what he points out is he was like, it's not a system it's actually a value. So what we need is like teachers and facilitators who embody the value. And then they walk into each novel scenario Mm. with that value and then present it to that unique group in the way that it's meant to be done at that period in time. It strikes me that that is so anti-evolutionary in some way. And what I mean is that there seems to be an evolutionary pull towards having something systemized, systematized, having some clear understanding of what something is, even if that understanding is not accurate, you know, we still go for it. I'm, I'm actually flashing back. If you haven't watched um, the, the special about George Carlin recently. Just um, watched it. Oh, so great. And it has something that's one of my favorite things that he said. He was on Charlie Rose. You see, no, I love individuals. I just don't like groups. And sometimes a group is as small as two people. And because, you know, then it becomes a solidified thing. And so I think that that there's got to be a reason that we do that. And I would argue it's an evolutionary reason. And so being cooperative and that kind of open is I'm just having fun with the phrase anti-evolutionary, just because it's so not the way we typically go about anything. And ironically, it's it's funny. It's funny. You know, we've built this company. There's now 67 of us. And I am really, really happy that there's no politics going on. There's nobody competing for the next position because there isn't a hierarchy like that. There's just everyone trying to do the right thing. And some people do it well. Some people do it less well. Some people really get that's what we're doing. Some people don't know, but that's what they're doing anyway. And it's, I think, I mean, there was a guy who worked for us for a while who always called me boss and I kept slapping him. I mean, not literally, but it's like, no, that doesn't (laughs) work here. That's not the game we're playing. And, um, you know, when we're doing developing products, everybody is involved. Um, There's lots of opinions and it ends up, you know, heading in the right direction. But it, but even that, it's so, we think of that as anti-corporate, which is anti-evolutionary in the same way. So anyway, I'm just ranting for a No, but you're, you're hitting an interesting point. I mean, because like we are, we are really patterned machines and we, and we have this magical way of yeah. seeing patterns around us and probably played a pretty integral role in us making it as far as we have on an evolutionary perspective. I think that more recently though, it's like, it's almost as if that ability to see patterns and, and create organization is like almost become all that we do. And maybe it's part of this like illusion of control that like now is kind of seeping into how we want to move through the world. Like, you know, because the, the, the blessing of consciousness and our unique consciousness is like all these things that we can do, like have this conversation the way we're doing it here today. Yeah. Um, but also then at the end of the day, part of that awareness is that we're fully clear about like our mortality and what's coming. And and that's pretty scary. And I think that like some of these things, like, you know, help kind of give that illusion that we're in more control of this uncontrollable world. We love the idea. Um, I mean, the, you know, I, I have this fantasy. I've said, if at some point Lena and I ever sell this company and we have a whole bunch of money, I'm going to go around to bookstores and buy all of the books on how to create a successful business and then take them into the parking lot and burn them. And, <laughs> Because, you know, we love this idea that someone can tell you, here's how to get to this thing that you think will make you happy. And I have a plan to get there. And then we just buy that crap, despite the fact that there's just nothing behind that that's remotely true. It's all like hindsight bias and survivorship bias. And, you know, people use Apple as an example of an amazing company. They forget in the 90s, Apple was an example of a company that's about to tank and crash. Or, you know, Enron was a great example of a company for a long time. And Theranos was a great, I mean, you know, it's like, but we, we do, we love this illusion of control because we know if somebody questions us about whether we do have that kind of control or not, push comes to shove, we're going to go, oh, maybe, maybe not as much as I think. 
And, and some people will be ballsy enough to go, yeah, no, I don't. Well, also, I think control is maybe closely aligned with what people think happiness is. Oh, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And, and happiness, I think, is what people think of when they think of like meaning and purpose. Mm. And I don't know what meaning or purpose is, but I know the times when I feel meaningful and purposeful. And it has more to do with what I was kind of describing, like, you know, really communicating with life and, and the world and, and that full body listening that I'm describing. Yeah. Those are the times where I'm like, this feels meaningful, like being with people, whether it's doing jujitsu or tossing a ball with them in the park um, or moving through the natural world in, in ways that asks all my senses to come alive mm. and participate. Like there's some sort of feeling of, of meaningfulness in that. And I think mm. that there are just a lot of forces at play that want to make us think that it's, it's something bigger, crazier, and probably more expensive. Well, again, you know, control, like you said, uh, that connection between control and happiness, I think is, I think you're really onto it because we do think that if we can control fill in the blank, then we'll be happy, despite the fact that no one has ever been able to control that. It's my favorite thing to talk about with regard to diet. It seems that like the way people approach diet, it's the one thing they know they can control to a certain extent on a daily basis, which gives them the idea that it will allow them to have the body that they want. It will allow them to, I mean, fill in the blank, but you know, most of the time it's it, again, a complete farce that that diet is going to be the thing that does feel, I mean, it, it, it seems to be, I don't want to put this the last, what's the, there's a phrase that I'm looking for. It's like the last something of desperate men. Um, you know, w- whenever there's something going on in your life, that's out of control, especially having it with your body, people turn to diet. It's like, oh, I've definitely got to change this. Where did you get that idea? There's a woman named Denise Minger who wrote a wonderful book called um, Death by Food Pyramid. And she's written a bunch of great blogs that are really, really long essays about health and nutrition. And I'm not going to get into those per se, but the most interesting thing is uh, in the last couple of years, she's been saying that she's no longer has any, she's not going to write about nutrition any longer. And knowing her previous writing where she would, she became like the bell of the paleo ball because she was a diehard raw food vegan and it really like was affecting her health badly. So then she went the exact other way and became like, you know, I'm just going to eat nothing but animals that I kill with my own bare hands, um, which I'm exaggerating for the fun of it. But um, and then she decided to investigate these like the counterfactuals, like going outside the room when someone says find a safe space. So she looked because the paleo movement was all carbs are bad, sugar is bad. She found places where people eat lots of carbs and lots of refined sugar, totally, totally healthy. Um, She found that there was a thing called the rice diet uh, that they did at Duke, which was taking up morbidly obese people and having them eat nothing but as much as they wanted, white sugar, white rice, and fruit juice. Almost impossible to stay on the diet, except that it literally made them go down to a normal weight and reverse their diabetes permanently. So she was looking for these contrarian things. Anyway, knowing that kind of thinking, when she said she's no longer going to write about nutrition, all I could extrapolate from that is she determined that there's no relationship between what you eat and longevity. Mm. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, but that's what we aim for. It's like, oh, I've got to eat this. Otherwise, fill in the blank. And, um, I mean, I, I joke with people that I'm on the, I don't know what I'm going to do, or I don't know when I'm going to get hit by a bus diet. If, mm-hmm. if it's enjoyable, I'm going to have some, I don't binge. It's not my thing. I mean, I'm making a cake right now. My birthday's coming up and I'm testing a cake. There's more sugar in this cake than I eat in a year. Mm-hmm. Can't wait to try it. <laughs> well, I think, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it's a hard topic to get into because I know where, many people can be coming from. But again, I almost I bring it back to almost like my message. I'm almost like, I don't know if we were like more playful and again, like playful isn't joyful, right? It's like, mm. it's, it's that place of just not trying to defeat everything. Mm. And if, and if we were like that kind of with like the world around us, sometimes I think that some of these things would work themselves out. Like you know? what? Like, like, I think that we have this kind of, there's a lot, there's an abundance of food, yeah. right? And I think that abundance is maybe a part of the emergence of the attempt to kind of control and defeat things. Like, <laughs> want to yeah. make sure we always like have enough, but it means that we're like a lot is being defeated for that our abundance. You know, like what we do right. to land, what we do to animals, what we do all these things. But like, 
if we were a little more like playful with like our relationship to the world in that way, maybe there wouldn't be so much of this abundance, you know? Mm. And I would also say that if now, if I were to go a little bigger, like if we were talking about kind of like food companies and things like that, not being so competitive and playing this finite game of, of trying to defeat one another and have the most customers and make the most money, maybe products wouldn't be out there that were so deeply, you know, call it unhealthy yeah. for people in mass abundance and also super cheap. Well, dude, we know people at pretty much every footwear brand in, that we've ever spoken with who say, oh no, we totally get this natural movement thing. We just can't do it because it would be admitting that everything we've ever said is a lie. Right. And so, you know, the goal to make money with the idea that somehow that'll eventually make you and or your shareholders or whomever else is at play uh, happy uh, drives a lot of behavior that is detrimental. But I would also argue, though, that human beings in general, we're really bad at predicting what the consequences of our actions are. And I drive, I literally drive around the street sometimes uh, or drive around the town sometimes looking at all the things that we did that we thought would be good ideas that mm-hmm. proved not to be. Here's a really simple one. Everyone thinks the solution to traffic is make highways wider, but the evidence is really clear. The more lanes you add, the more traffic there is. So it's like, but who knew the first time? It's like, it seemed obvious. We need to have more road, road for the car. It didn't work. And that's just, there's things like that over and over and over. I'm kind of everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're all just kind of like tinkering and stumbling and everything. I think we also just, you know, yeah, but we don't admit, but we don't admit that's what we're doing. Exactly. And we expect people to like hit the nail on the head yeah. every time. And, you know, which means we've like stigmatized failure and, you know, there's oh, yeah. and things, but it's like, you know, everybody is just like making their best guesses and, and, and stumbling this is- forward. This is something I'm I'm taking this out of context. This is something that I've been railing against lately. I've discovered in the financial world, Mm -hmm. what I now refer to as the venture industrial complex, that there's this whole industry about investing in companies that is based on the, based on the fact that no one is willing to admit the one obvious thing, which is what you just said, which is no one, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, no one knows nothing. They just don't, they can't predict what's going to work, what's not going to work. And so they build this whole ecosystem to try to control it that ironically kills most of the companies that could be the successful ones because it puts it, because to protect themselves, the bankers, the investors, et cetera, they put the source of their livelihood at risk in ways that they don't, all because no one's willing to go, yeah, I don't know. I'm taking a guess. Stab in the dark. Yeah, well, I mean, it makes me think of uh, this author Nassim Taleb, who writes about like, oh my the, God. you know, financial industry quite a bit. Yeah, and he's, you know, what well, you're describing is like when you're when you're limiting the exposure, when you're limiting the surprise, you're not embracing like a complex system's potential to be anti-fragile, which I think is his word. Well, Taleb's first in, in "Fooled by Randomness," which is the book that most people don't know, they know the Black Swan. Um, the subtitle, The Hidden Role of Chance in Markets and Life. And the biggest thing, you if you really read that book, you come out of it realizing to a certain extent, no one knows nothing. And the, and more, if you think you are someone who knows something, you are setting yourself up for failure. Right. Because you've decided that you have answers rather than questions. And, you, and, you're, pulling and, your, and you're pulling the past with you into the present in ways where it doesn't apply. Right. And the answers are basically trying to kind of maintain the status quo, whereas like the questions, the what ifs that you can yeah. propose yeah. is when you are willing to expose yourself, right, to uncertainty. And as he said, that's like what makes the complex system robust is like it needs that exposure. It's like a it's like an immune system. You know what I mean? Like it needs to keep like getting the exposure to like fill in those little gaps for the things that are going to happen, what he calls the black swans. Yeah. Well, the uncertainty is the, is there every day. Lena early on. Um, was sort of upset one day. And she said, you know, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. I said, no one knows what we're doing. I mean, no one's ever done what we're doing before. In many, many ways, our job is to hopefully be smart enough to figure out what we need to learn to then address pretty much the fire that started overnight, despite the fact that nothing changed since yesterday. And she said, oh, I can do that. I said, yeah, I know you're super smart. Um, And I say this on a (laughs) sadly daily basis where my disappointment or upset is not because of whatever just happened or the thing that someone told me. It's because that uh, crashed head first into the expectation I had about the future. That not even the control that I was hoping, but just like 
what I was expecting, what I was imagining was going to happen and what was necessary, what would be useful, et cetera. And, um, and I go, it's going to take me somewhere between a minute and day to get over it. And then, mm-hmm. uh, then we'll have some creative idea of what to do next, but I'm going to be, you know, not happy for some finite period of time. <laughs> and that one's important to me because it's helpful for me to acknowledge to other people, you know, here's exactly what's going on, but more, I also know that it's going to take a little while to unwind and it's nothing personal. It's just, that's what, you know, minds and bodies do. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, we've, uh, not again, but we have stigmatized patients, right? We've stigmatized, <laughs> yeah. stigmatized boredom. We've stigmatized rest. And it's like, you know, that's when a lot of these things would kind of work themselves out. And like, it's, it makes it feel like we're not allowed to admit to those things in some ways. Well, it's a variation. It, it occurs to me, I agree. And it's a variation of, um, you know, Lane and I, one of the reasons I think we have a great relationship is we've never said something like, I need you to hear what I'm feeling. So if we're upset, we haven't, we both seem to have the same natural tendency to kind of walk away and wait till things settle down and then have a conversation rather than trying to deal with it when you're in the middle of what I refer to as, you know, you can't be smart when you're stupid, when your brain is not working well, there's nothing you can do about it. You have to wait till it settles down. You can't control the, uh, this is, you can't control your ability to get creative again. It's going to happen when it happens, no matter what you try and do. And there's a whole industry and the whole like meditative world is promoting this idea that you can achieve some sort of supernatural calmness that pervades through every possible scenario in your life. I mean, it's the ultimate kind of control is that sales pitch. And we've never met anyone who's actually lived that way. Yeah. I mean, I, I meditate a lot and frequently, and I would never claim any amount of like calmness, but what I do believe is that it like, you know, from my understanding in like Zen meditation, right. They do this thing called the koan, right. And the koan is, is like a riddle. And from my understanding, it's there to basically distract your thinking mind, right. Your conscious mind to a point that there are these little like cracks where your unconscious mind can kind of like seep through a little bit. And that, that is that kind of integration of the conscious and the unconscious mind. And I think to myself that like, to me, meditation is, is creating the opportunity to like see more options, right? Because kind of underneath the, the conscious mind, which is like where our ego is built and like our ego is like the story of who we think we are, Mm -hmm. right? our options are limited to that. But like, as you go lower towards like the unconscious, like that, like kind of pure consciousness, it's a sea of options, mm. right. That are below our, our, what we think we can, who we think we are and kind of creating opportunities for those cracks to come through, I think is, is a pretty valuable little tool. I think I'm going to reframe con practice for you in a way that I, I hope is useful. Mm. I think it's actually a form of play. Mm-hmm. I think because what it's pointing out is which part of your body isn't touching the tennis ball. Mm-hmm. What it's pointing out is which thing, what's that way that you're standing that's communicated something that no one had told you. And the koan gives you a chance to eventually see it because you just can't, there's nowhere else to go. It's like, you know, what was your fa- Show me your face before you were born. You can't do that logically. There's no right answer. And the only way, the way you quote, solve the koan is by doing something that breaks out of the box of only rolling the ball with your right hand to come exactly. up with an answer. So I don't need, I, I, I don't know from, you know, conscious, unconscious, but koans like, uh, cause I've gone through a bunch. I'll tell you this one. A friend of mine was doing a long time Zen session, uh, you know, meditating for 20 hours a day. And he was just like, really, really, like, like really aggressively trying to make sure he wasn't having any thoughts. And he was, you know, just doing the practice. And the teacher pulls him aside at four in the morning and says, this is about being kind to yourself and having fun. He's like, (laughs) what? (laughs) And people, but people approach that practice often trying to, you know, as another thing to to win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, I literally think of con practices as um, they're really clever jokes. And if you don't get the joke, then you're going to be frustrated by it. And once you get the joke, then the response is really, I mean, that's the natural response, whatever that means. And you said it there, you said it's like a form of play, but like when you're, when you're playing, you're creating the opportunity for the same thing to happen, right? Yeah. For the opportunity to see the more options. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's the other thing about whether it's um, Zen practice or you know, whether it's koan practice or any other form of meditation, you're putting yourself in a situation where you've limited your options to begin with. You're sitting in a place in a way, trying not to move. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I like to think of certain meditations where it's shoving you into a corner so deeply that your only response, because you can't get out of the corner, is to do something completely unconditioned mm-hmm. because there's no other option. You're just backed up as far as you can go and you got to break out of that and you can't do it in any way that's ever been done before. So the options are limitless and you get there by being crazily limited. Yeah. Yeah. It's like with any sort of play or improvisation, it's like, it's the create, it's the constraints that create create the opportunities. I am, you know, I used to do something. I don't, I, I had a word for what I did, but I can't remember what it was. I'd go and see when I was doing comedy for a living, I'd go see friends who did improv. And my favorite thing to do was whenever they asked for a suggestion was think of the most outrageous thing they could, you know, they've ever heard. So it would, you just then watch them go, Oh crap, I'm going to really have to do something totally different here. Cause I have no idea where to go with that one. Name something people are obsessed with bulgur wheat. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then you watch people's heads explode for a few minutes. <laughs> and, uh, or my favorite one, I don't think this was mine. I think this was the one that gave me the idea. Somebody said, give me a popular phrase. And this is at a university with a bunch of science people. And the phrase that someone yelled out was, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. <laughs> watch a bunch of really good improv actors go, uh. <laughs> and, they, and they redid it syllable by syllable. That was the only way. <laughs> Wow. wow. Well, speaking of improv, since, uh, since you said it, it's one of my favorite things to mention because, you know, there's always this, these talks that come up right around like the movement space of who great movers are, like who, yeah. who, who are these amazing characters. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, like Bruce Lee will come up or Charlie Chaplin, you know, these are like the kind of the, the, the ideal movers. And, Charlie Chaplin's amazing, but I, people often say Bruce Lee. And I, and I say like, I'm not so like, I don't know a ton about Bruce Lee. I know that he created an art form and he's amazing and, and, and all, all this, but I really don't know enough about him to know that that's my kind of like North star for movement. Yeah. Cause I don't know enough to know whether he was playful, but there is somebody who I do know is quite playful and that's my North star. And I always say that it's Bill Murray. <laughs> he, he can show up and sees options in any scenario with any person and can move playfully through life. And to me, I'm like, that's the thing. You know, I think about that one a lot because I wonder if Bill Murray could be Bill Murray if he wasn't Bill Murray. If he <sighs> didn't know who he was, if he wasn't rich, if he, you know, if, if he didn't have this thing walking in the door where people already are okay with that. If you just did that as a normal human being, mm-hmm. um, there's a some of the things I, th- I think about this. Some of the things he's done, he could get away with if he was just a normal dude. Others, not a chance. Right. And that's the part that I'm intrigued by. Like he does, seem, he does seem to have a strong awareness of his role and how absolutely to be him. And I think that, that he's able to like play with that. It makes me think that if he wasn't famous, Bill Murray, yeah, and still had that awareness, he would be able to play with the different options minus yeah. the fame. I'm willing to bet that he did some of those things before he became Bill Murray, um, mostly around friends and mostly in situations that either made them, you know, fall on the floor laughing or embarrass them to no end. Um, But then when he became Bill Murray, it became open season. It's like, I can live my whole life like this and just go from one to the other. Now, granted, he's having some think some issues right now, ostensibly, but independent of that, you know, yeah, to be, to know that you can be a catalyst for fun at a level yeah. that no one else, that maybe no one else on the planet can pull off. Mm-hmm. I just keep thinking that must be the best. Yeah. Now, yeah. I don't know. It'd be really interesting to find him and find out what his perception of that is. It may be that he thinks there's a whole lot of pressure there too, but, um, uh, but that's a really that's a really interesting one. Are you, I can't ever, as we're having this talk about him, all I can think about is him showing up at a frat party. Do you know that story? No, is that was, I think that one was in the movie. I watched this movie. Yeah, yeah it was. It yeah, was. I thought, yeah, my friend, I, I've talked about this before, but my friend uh, who I haven't talked to in many years, but he told me once he had a Bill Murray story from the village here. Uh, he and his buddy were walking down the street, smoking a joint and Bill Murray came up to him and asked if he could have a hit. <laughs> So Bill Murray's like holding this joint now and he's smoking weed with them and they're chatting. And these guys are like, this is the best night ever. Um, And he said, (laughs) he said to them, 
you guys want to have a really great story to tell? And I think they were both like, man, the story's already amazing, but sure, let's make it better. So Bill Murray shoves both of them and then takes off running down the street with the joint in his hand. And he gets like a block away and he screams at him. Now you can tell everyone that Bill Murray stole weed from you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. I mean, like the first part of just walking up and saying, can I get a hit off that? That one is totally doable pre Bill Murray. And I say that because I've done things at that level. I don't smoke weed, but I mean, but like a bunch of us were um, like six of us were at a restaurant and there was another table next to us that was six people who looked just like us. And they got up and left before we did. And they left a bunch of leftovers on their plate. And I turned to the people at my table. I said, if those were our friends, if they were sitting at this table with us, we would just eat their leftovers. And everyone laughed. And then I went and grabbed their plates and brought their leftovers over and ate them. And so um, I was telling this story later to somebody while sitting in a restaurant. I was there with my wife and a friend and I was telling this story. And there was a guy sitting next to us who then just handed me his leftovers. <laughs> and, really? then, and then we became really good friends. So there's a certain level of Bill Murrayness that you definitely can pull off whoever you are. But then there's a whole Bill Murray level. Right. But I think he has that, that, that ability to, to listen in the deep way. Yes. Yes. Really listen, like it's with his whole body. And I think that like, I don't know, the more we feed that and the more, the more options we see for these moments, like you just had, you know, like you can like the listening can happen and like, then like the, the, in all the ways that help kind of manifest those moments. It, it, it sometimes takes a while to kind of get to, you know, get to where we want to go in a conversation or where we didn't know we were going to go, but we get somewhere that's fun. And I think this, and this is things that we've been saying for the last hour, but I want to highlight it. Everything we're talking about is really the opportunity to find options that we didn't know existed and to whether we create them or they just land in our lap or hit us in the face or in the back of the head. Um, It's just, how can we create options? And I think the idea of um, turning Bill Murray into a verb might be, um, you know, might be a good place to land with that. How can we Bill Murray this? Exactly. Oh, I love that. I love that. If things don't, if, if things don't work out for infinite play, I'm just going to start calling it Bill Murray. That's Bill Murraying. And yeah. so now I'm hoping that someone knows Bill Murray and they, you know, have him call me up and we can talk about this um, because I, there's no question in my mind that to a certain extent we have done a little positive projection and are thinking that his life is better than maybe it is. And there's also part where we don't know the half of it. And, uh, um, and, you know, we may not have heard the best stories yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. If you, if you can get him on the podcast, just let me know so I can at least come on and like, uh, throw a few questions at him. I'm just going to try and get him on the phone and get some shoes on his feet. Are you nuts? So, 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 so now that we've kind of, you know, taken this wacky circuitous route, which is of course appropriate for the conversation, because we had no idea where we were going to go. And, and there it went as we bring this in for not even a landing, but for the transition from what we've been doing to something next where we're not on a podcast. (laughs) And what would you like to kind of leave people with in addition to how can they get in touch with you? Is there anything else that you want to kind of bring this to the next whatever with? Yeah. I think that one thing that I often like to remind people of is that we often exist in places, right. Where we're led to feel like we're not enough. And it can be like in in friendships or in workshops or in our societies or our jobs where we're made to feel like what we are right now is not enough. And we need to do more Mm. to become the thing that we're supposed to be, which also leaves us wishing that yesterday and a year ago, we had done the thing so that in this moment, we would be the thing that we were supposed to, that we think will be in five years or whatever. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And really what I, I want to emphasize is that like when we play, it's this beautiful gateway to like seeing that like right now we're enough. And right now we have all the things that we need to, to, to be and enjoy and be happy. And all it just needs to do is just be dusted off a little bit because the enoughness exists right now. And I wish for more spaces where, where we, where we kind of celebrate the, you are enough idea, as opposed to always getting everybody caught up in the time traveling of you're not enough here's the reasons you're not enough. Someday you'll be enough. Um, I say, I say just for a moment, drop the idea that you're a self-improvement project. Yeah. 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 And that right now you're perfect. If you lock out the door and think, Oh, like I have all the tools, I'm enough. 
I've got it. Like whatever I am today is exactly what I'm supposed to be. I think that like the play will be, will be really enjoyable. I think there's a, I want to add a caveat to that. Tell me what you think of this. The, I know that if, when you say something like that, some people that think, yeah, but I don't like fill in the blank, something about myself, the way I'm thinking, the way my body is, whatever. Let's just use thinking like, you know, I have negative thoughts. Like, yeah, that's okay. That's just what's arising now. And we have the idea if someone says, Hey, you know, you're fine as you are, you're enough. They go, they project and imagine that what that means is they're going to have that same experience in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. They'll have some unpleasant thing in perpetuity. And that argues with the idea of being enough or being whatever, or certainly perfect and forget that in a moment that may change. And in fact, in the moment that they're arguing in their head with this idea, it's already changed that, that, you know, it's slow. Again, it's, there's that thing of just seeing the landscape differently. And what you just said is a provocative way of doing it because it will, it will come right up into people's face and saying, no, my fill in the blank is not fill in the blank. And uh, I mean, they're mad libs, they're doing mad libs with their own self um, to argue with that idea. And, and the joke being that a, it will change. And the second joke being, it just did because you're having that argument. And right. And yeah. also the idea then that, that people might feel like the negative part of their experience is something that's wrong. Or right. an anxiety, Correct. that's that part of being enough is like Correct. The, the sorrow and the joy and the happiness is that like fills up the, the do, enough. Do you know that you're, you're, you're doing a, a kind of elaboration of another Zen line? So no. there's a, a Zen line uh, before Zen mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. Mm-hmm. During Zen mountains are no longer mountains and rivers are no longer rivers. After Zen mountains are rivers, sorry, mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. And people like to think that means that once you become quote unquote enlightened, that everything is magical and special. And the Zen line is saying, no, no, no. During that time when you were practicing or improving or doing whatever, every that's when everything was not what it is. You weren't letting it be what it is. And then what you come to realize is, no, no, it's totally fine. Exactly as it is. Nothing extra, nothing special. And it's not just mountains or rivers. It's every thought you have, every experience you have every, everything, mountains are mountains, rivers are rivers. And another way of saying that, saying that is the mind, um, there's another line, which is that everyone has Buddha nature. And all that means is that, um, yes, if you became this thing called awakened, you'd be having the exact same experience you're having now, exactly the same people. No, no, the Buddha was, you know, and they fill in the blank with some story that they've made up. So what you just said is, you know, just synopsizing 2000 years of Buddhism. Oh, wow. Well, I, I, always, <laughs> I, I always think about it in this way because I'm, I'm a big Alan Watts fan. And mm. at one point he was talking about this idea of like the seed in the tree. I don't know if you've heard this one, this lecture, yeah. but it was the idea that like nobody looks at that time between when the seed is in the ground and when the tree is fully grown and criticizes it. <laughs> for that any of the points along the way that it's like not a seed or a tree yeah like you look at all the points between one and the other and it's like well that's exactly where it's supposed to be yeah and i and in and applying that to us and applying that to human beings and our existence and our lives and our relationships but you know, like you know the difference right now is the thing is what it's supposed to be but you know here's the here's the difference in the problem with that is that then people think yeah i want to become a tree what do i need to do they start because the, you know because the difference is that there's an end goal in mind and this is where we all get hung up is that once we have that end goal in mind that's when we start having to add more to those states in between it's like am i getting there am i getting the right way is it going to be you know am i going to be that tall as a tree am i going to be this tall as a tree there're going to be other trees that are sucking up some of my light so cuz i i'm going to i'm going to suggest for the fun of it just because of, from what you said given your desire for options and play the problem with that alan watts metaphor is we know the end result already mm-hmm. to some degree but we don't know the the shape, the size, the direction, the this, the that. I think. True. I think okay. It, you know, it, okay. And in our like, you know, our life the way it is. Ah, got the, it. What we compare ourselves to and judgment, all these things. It's like we imagine that we're going to be the redwood that's like perfectly Perfect. straight, 
perfectly symmetrical in all these things. Perfect. Yes. I, 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 uh, I, I re what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I take that point that I made and throw it away. I, <laughs> uh, I object your honor sustained. Um, so, uh, yes. So, um, I'm objecting to myself and sustaining myself. Um, I want to, I want to pro propose one more, more film just because okay. we've talked about one of my favorites that I bring up recently, but the other one is the one that I talk about constantly. And I think it's the one that's always worth watching. And it's the movie soul. The Pixar film. Oh, and I haven't seen it and I've wanted to. Oh, well, then we might have to do a part two, but okay. you should watch Soul. Okay. Um, and okay. there's just this beautiful, beautiful scene where this soul that's never been to Earth before is on Earth for the first time in like an adult body that right. it's like arrived in and is like moving through these moments and like feel like witnessing like the leaf fall from a tree and tasting pizza for the first time and having this like amazing conversation with a barber and then feeling the wind blow up from the grate underneath um, from the subway and and just being taken by by all yeah. of it you yeah. know and the idea that like it's not you know the seed in the tree of these like kind of peak moments right that yeah. we're kind of always looking for these peaks but like all of that space in between is also like the space where like those same feelings and experiences can happen if we're like, if we're listening. I'm, I'm now taking your tree, your and Alan Watts' tree metaphor to the next phase where the, <laughs> where the tree uh, has done as much as it can. And for whatever reason, falls down, decomposes and starts all over again. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I like that one. And by the way, with soul, I think some of that was taken from Starman, which is with Jeff Bridges, where it's my favorite bit where he discovers apple pie. So he's, you know, it comes into a human body. And then there's a scene where they're at a diner and they bring the pie and the food. He starts eating the pie first. And I, I wish I could remember the name of the actress who plays opposite him. No, no, you eat that last. It's like, yeah, okay. And then just eats the pie. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. no, no, this is the way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, all right. Well, that was the, that was the most um, non landing landing we've ever taken. I, that was really delightful. Um, Kyle, if somebody wants to get in touch with you and have more fun, how do they do that? Uh, my website is kylefincham.com and I've got my blog on there. I've got the podcast and your episode will be up uh, in the next couple of weeks. Okay, smokes. Um, I also have my schedule for my upcoming events. So I'll be headed to Europe next week and I'll be there all the way through August doing a workshop every single weekend. And then my Instagram is just at the infinite play guy, the infinite play guy. I like it. And Kyle Finch, and by the way, K Y L E F I N C H A M. Did I get it right? Cool. Right on. Beautiful. Kyle, total, total treat. Um, really looking forward to us next. Thank you so much for, being here, even though you're not here, you're just a disembodied face on my computer screen. Yeah. And in real life too. I have no evidence that you have a body at this point. Um, for, all <laughs> I, for all I know, you're just a head in a torso. So the feeling uh, is mutual. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am just a head in the torso. So there you go. Uh, for everybody else who may also be heads and torsos at some time in your life, Thank you for being here. Go to www.jointhemovementmovement.com. Find previous episodes, other ways you can find the podcast, how you can find us on social media, um, which is YouTube and Facebook and Instagram. And you know what social media is. What am I saying? Um, and again, like and share and thumbs up and hit the bell on YouTube. Again, if you want to be part of the tribe, just subscribe. And if you have any requests or feedback um, or people, you know, things that you think I should know or someone who should be on the show or whatever you can think of, you can drop me an email. It's just move, M-O-V-E at jointhemovementmovement.com. And until the next one, as always, just go out, have fun and live life feet first.